I want to invite Tom up. He doesn't know that I'm going to do this, but Tom, would, would you go ahead and come? He's going to preach this morning. So the reason I am still standing here is because I want to honor him. You know, there's something powerful about honor. And uh, I have known him, honestly, as far back as I can remember. Um, I don't know exactly what age. I was pretty much born in this church, for those that don't know. If you're new here, uh, my parents have been pastoring for 30 years. I am 30 years old. So that correlates perfectly. But I want to honor this man for what he carries and what he has meant to not only my life but to this body. Um, I don't know if, if you're coming in and maybe you, you haven't been here for any length of time. Like Tom's office is like what we call, it is like the sanctuary, man. I mean, it's the place where like you come, you encounter the heart of the Father. Uh, you do a little bit of crying if you're me and uh, <laughs> others. But I just want to honor him for, for, for what he has meant. Like the amount of things that I've even walked through personally that I've walked into Tom's office and I've just had found freedom from, and just a, a, a voice, the wisdom that he, he carries, what he's meant to my family, like, I, I don't even have words. And so can we just stand up real quick, and can we honor Tom Dermott this morning? Yeah, come on. I will give you the check after. Okay. <laughs> so this morning I want to continue on in our... Thanks, Andrew. That, that means a lot. It really does. So, I remember one time one of our admins came in. She just sat down in my office. I like, didn't say anything. She was looking at me. And I said, okay. Went back to work. And after a few minutes she burst into tears and said, it's true. <laughs> it's true what happens in here. And she left. <laughs> okay, anyways, so this morning I want to, con we're going to continuing on in our Encountering God series. Are you up next weekend? Wesley. Wesley, and then you? Woo. Okay, it's pretty cool. Woo. Steve's asked a yeah. bunch of different people to, to deal with this, and I love that. Your different giftings and the different way that you see scriptures and stuff. So it's going to be really good. Ever felt like this guy? Psalm 103, first five verses, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. This morning, I'm going to have probably twice as many slides as I normally do. So what I would like you to do, I'm going to click into major teacher mode here. Just sit back and relax. If something strikes you, go ahead and write it down. But I mean, I'm, I have a lot. So what I'm going to do at the end, I'm going to put my email address up. So if you want these slides, go ahead and email me and tell me you'd like to have a copy of them and I'll get them to you. And I just want you to lean back and relax and see what the Lord's going to do this morning. So, have you ever been here before? You sin again. Something you've done before, something you've confessed, something you've repented of, and yet here it is again. You're embarrassed, confused, tired. Hope is rapidly becoming deferred. How could I do this again? Didn't I turn away from this sin last time? 
Why didn't it take? So we, we resolve to do better, maybe even put some boundaries in place. Sin again. What's going on? What's wrong with me? So you beat yourself up, trying to beat yourself into more discipline and more obedience. You make more promises and end up breaking those two. Eventually, you begin to lose hope that you're ever going to be free from this thing. So why is our promise to never do this again not working? So I want to propose to you this morning that it's iniquity that fuels our sin patterns. And I'm going to spend the rest of our morning together breaking this down. It whispers lies about who we are. And as we believe them, we are driven to prove them wrong. These patterns are often rooted in the stories that we tell ourselves. Now, I've been sitting on this, studying this revelation, looking at this thing of iniquity for about two years now. And then when Steve said, I want you, know, I want you to, we're going to look at this one psalm, that one word jumped out to me, and I felt like the Lord gave me a green light to go ahead and talk about this. So exactly what is iniquity? But first of all, we have to understand that sin and iniquity are not the same thing. This word avon in Hebrew and iniquity in English are the very same word as the word unrighteousness found throughout the Bible. Iniquity appears in 37 books of the Bible 262 times in both the Old and New Testament. It also includes and incorporates the idea of a stamped impression, like what happens when someone hammers pattern into leather. In other words, iniquity is something that leaves a mark. So iniquity, unrighteousness, then, is a belief that your identity is based on what you do instead of the identity that God gives you. The Bible calls this iniquity. It's the absolute, absolute opposite of grace and mercy, as we're going to see in just a few minutes. In biblical terms, iniquity means to be void of the truth, thereby trading the law of life by which God declares you righteous, holy, and blessed for another law upon which you base your life on your performance. This is the lie that says, by my abilities, my gifting, and my possessions, I will have quality of life. Do you remember back in Ezekiel? 28, talking about Satan here, Lucifer, you were the anointed cherub that covers with overshadowed wings. And notice this, and I set you so. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire, like the paved work of gleaming sapphire stone, upon which the Lord God of Israel walked on Mount Sinai. You were blameless in all of your ways from the day you were created until iniquity and guilt were found in you. Keep in mind here that Satan, Adam, and Eve were all in paradise. So that should tell us something that no one is exempt from iniquity. Satan's sin, his iniquity, was taking his eyes off of God and his ability, his strengths, and his gifting. In other words, pride. And that's really what I want to deal with here this morning. Pride is the root of all sin. I'm approaching my 40th year of full-time Christian ministry. 25 of those have been meeting with people. And I can tell you, this is absolutely true. Pride is the root of all sin. Every failure was first the failure of self-exaltation. Pride it will, little by little, whether you can perceive it or not, erode you and your life from the inside out. Every one of my sins can be traced back to, to my failure to allow Christ to be my life in a particular area. I love this by Andrew Murray. There's three downfalls of, downfalls of pride. Loss of spiritual life, an absence of love, and an inability to learn. We so, say, well, that third one doesn't make sense. 
What can I teach you this morning if pride is operating in your life? What can anybody teach you this morning? What can you learn? That's why I've determined I'm going to be a lifelong learner. So for our purposes here this morning, we have to ask the question, how much of God, how much of God are we going to encounter with pride, with iniquity operating in our lives? You know, Friday, we had a priceless opportunity. Staff at LCU, faculty, lifestyle Christianity, has spent an entire day with Eric Gilmore, one of my favorite teachers that comes to the school. And he was talking about one time, he was still pretty young in the faith, he was on staff, full-time. Or, uh, and one of his jobs was to go to the airport and, and pick up the speaker. Now, he didn't say who the speaker was, but I could tell who he was talking about. And they're driving back to the church, and the speaker says, so let's spend some time in prayer. Why don't you start? So Eric, wanting to impress this guy, took off, and man, he's Shonda, and he's this, and God, that. He's literally working up a sweat for about 20, 30 minutes. Nothing happens. So he looks over to this guy, and he says, tell you what, why don't you pray? And this older gentleman leaned back in, his, in the seat and said, Jesus, I love you. And the presence of God just rushed into the car and just overwhelmed him. Eric said he was in tears in seconds. That's where I want to live. That's where I want to lo- live. Jesus, I love you. And his presence is immediately, you're standing in line, and just cashier, and you're, you're in Walmart, and you're in this place, and you're worshiping in the presence of God. And people are looking at you like, what in the world is going on? People are starting to kind of weave around a little bit. This happens all the time. I want to live there. At Lifestyle, we have what we're calling closets, where every one of the staff members can speak. It's about 20 minutes to demonstrate how they do their quiet time, how they wait on the Lord. And one of the things, that last Monday was mine. And one of the things I said, though, okay, guys, when you leave the closet, take it with you. You should never leave the prayer closet. Take it with you everywhere that you go. Satan, <clears throat> Satan I have a little bit of cough. It's not COVID. It's allergies. <laughs> so if I cough, then back row, you don't need to start backing up, okay? (laughs) Satan started to think his identity, started to find his identity and his ability, thinking that he was great because he came into agreement with the lie of iniquity. In other words, the three most, my guys, you know this, the three most dangerous words for every man, I got this. Proverbs 16, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand joins in hand, he shall not be unpunished. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. And we really need to look into this further. We need to understand how iniquity works and how it can bring forth spiritual death. I'm not talking about losing your salvation, but how it can bring bring forth spiritual death in our lives. So remember when God made us, he created us in his likeness and in his image. So if we were created in his likeness, then why did Adam and Eve feel the need to do something to become like him? Eve should have told the servant, I'm already like him. I was created in his image. I don't have to eat from a tree or do any religious exercises to be like him. However, they did not do that. They, male and female, ate of the tree, trying to become what they already were, trying to get what they already have, and many of us still do. Iniquity then? manifests itself in the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions, creating these dense veils that can prevent us from encountering God. Now, what I'm talking about there, there, we know that nothing separates us from the love of God, but when there's pride, when there's iniquity operating in your life, it can feel like there is something separating you from the presence of God. It is the force that pulls us on us to live out of our mind in our own understanding and makes us dependent on our own ways of thinking rather than God's. Again, 
Iniquity is I am by what I can do, which is a basic definition of an orphan. And you know, this viewpoint of Satan has never left him. It's how he came to Eve, and it's how he comes to us. It's how he came to Jesus in the desert, tempting him by saying that he could find his sonship in his ability to turn a stone into bread. However, Jesus believed he didn't need to find his identity as a son of God by doing miracles. Belief that you are, belief that you are is based on what you do. When God actually gave you the ability to begin with, is called iniquity. And this is the absolute opposite of grace and mercy. Again, in biblical terms, iniquity means to be void of the truth, thereby trading the law of life by which God declares you righteous, holy, and blessed for another law upon which you base your life. And unfortunately, this iniquity has spread through to all mankind, causing all kinds of experiences of guilt and shame, all of those things, fear. Even though, even though, even though Jesus already dealt with all those things on the cross. This is why, and this is just my opinion, someone can repent but never see any real change because the root of that sin, which is pride, has never been dealt with. And this frustrated me for so many years because I worked with so many different men. I couldn't figure out why these guys, including myself, would go back and they would spend this time in repentance and never really see any major breakthrough. And then when God began to give me this revelation of iniquity, I began to see you can repent of your sin, but if you don't repent of the, the, that the root that that sin is coming from, you're not going to see breakthrough. And when I began to incorporate that into my ministry times, guys began to see freedom and breakthrough almost immediately. And I love this by Eric Gilmore. Every semester before I teach on the spiritual gifts, this is the first slide I put up. Pride can creep in when we become satisfied with one of God's gifts. Such a fixation upon something that comes from him can cause us to forget God himself. You can cheat on God with something that God has given you. Well, that just, that went right through me the first time I heard him say that. You can cheat on God with something that God has given you. And this is a very important truth. How many have fallen in love with the ministry that God has given them? How many are mesmerized by their own supernatural gifts? How easy it is to rejoice in this or that and all the while forget the person of God. And I'm telling you, it can happen. I've watched it happen in my own life. You get so busy doing and forget about being, and eventually it will catch up with you. So let's go back to our text here. Beginning in verse 6, the Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished, punished us according to our iniquities. So as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Now, another word for this word removed here. I was talking about this in our elders meeting. I was telling Steve and Steve which way I felt like we were supposed to go. And Steve Winston made this comment. I said, can you send that to me? This is what he said. A pardon without conditions, which, is re which removes any remaining penalties or punishments. An act of grace proceeding from the power entrusted with the execution of the laws, which exempts the individual on whom it was bestowed from the punishment the law inflicts for a crime he has committed. Well, keep in mind here, though, 
what David is doing when he's writing here, actually what he's doing is he's prophesying. So let's go back. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Sin here means to be without a share in, or in other words, to not be a partaker of something, to miss the mark. When we are in a state of sin, all that's saying is we are not partaking of, because of pride, what God has freely offered us. When sin has entered the world through Adam, we were not partakers of the divine nature anymore. Instead, we were partakers of life by our own ability, which leads us to death. Unbelief, again, we're talking about pride here. In what Jesus Christ came to bring to mankind is when someone chooses not to have his mind at rest in his union with God through Jesus by partaking of what Jesus has freely given. Even though on the cross Jesus freely dealt with sin and iniquity because of pride, they are missing the mark according to the true definition of sin. So because of ignorance and unbelief, They are missing out on what God has freely given to all people. Therefore, it's not God refusing to bless them, but them not walking in the new law of liberty that God has brought to all people. When Adam refused the innocence offered him as a free gift, he implemented another system called life by my works and by my knowledge. And I want to close, and we'll go into a time of prayer reading from 2 Timothy. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knew those who were his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So what I want to do this morning, is bow your heads. We're going to enter into a time of prayer. Guys, if we get some kind of pad or something for just a few minutes here, somebody come to the keys. Got up this morning about five o'clock, which I normally do. And, uh, At the house to myself, Wendy, Wendy has um, got up about 4.30 to head to Franklin. My youngest, Judah, is having a baseball tournament down there. There's a bunch of scouts that are going to be there. So we're quiet in the house. And as I looked into the spirit, I saw where we are right now. And I saw angels stationed all around the room. In fact, I sensed them right away this morning. They're here, all lined up all around the side, around the back on the side over here, and they're holding keys. Now, these keys are all different sizes. Some are really big. I don't think it's significant of the size. But for some of you here this morning, the angels are here to hand you keys to the next thing that you need in your life. But in order for them to do that, this is what I really felt in my spirit, man, was you have to give them permission. They're not ever going to force anything on you. So if you feel like that's you, you feel like you desperately need a key. What I talked about this morning very well could be the key. It could be your missing key. It could be what's keeping you from the next thing the Lord has for you. Because he told me one time when I went through a real, really hard season, really experiencing a lot of fear, the Lord said, this is actually an act of grace and mercy for you because I cannot let you take that thing into the next season that I have for you. It's actually great grace. So let's just be still here in a minute. If you feel like the angels are here for you and they have a key for you, let's keep this really simple. Just give them permission. Say, yes, I need that. Thank you. So let's just do that right now.
as you take it, just hold it there in your hand and just say the thank you. You don't have to know all the details right now. Just will unfold it. for, and this has already begun this morning, there's keys for emotional healing. You've done everything you know to do, but that thing is still there. I really feel like the key is the lock. It will unlock that thing that you need. There's keys for emotional healing, for physical healing. Man, I'm really feeling this all over the room. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing. the people in the room, what I've talked about this morning has been your missing key. You're living a life low. You live a life of repentance like you just cannot get that thing out. It's like you'll go months. There's someone you've actually went a year you actually begin to forget about it if that thing got back in again. This just might be your missing key. So I want to lead us in a prayer. I want you just stay there, stay in this place. you just pray this with me, whether out loud, whatever feels good to you, and say, Lord, open my eyes to any lie that is keeping me from trusting you. Father, I ask that you reveal any lie that separates me from close, intimate relationships. that Adam had with you in the garden. Lord, reveal any lie that's separating me from intimacy. Father, I ask you open my eye to whoever lie that binds me to doubt and unbelief in your word. Your faithfulness the perfection of your love towards me. Father, I renounce the original lie that you have withheld any good from me. And Father, I renounce pride in any area where I feel like it's been up to me to make it work. Father, I renounce pride in any area where I feel like it's been up to me to make it work. Now, Father, I repent for myself and those in my bloodline who wanted to be the center of the universe. And have everyone look and pay attention to me, to them, instead of giving glory to you. Let me say that again. This is a big deal. So, Father, I repent for myself and any of those in my bloodline who wanted to be the center of the universe. And having everyone look and pay attention to me instead of giving glory to you. Lord, I repent for receiving my identity from man. And what others think of me instead of you. Father, I repent for myself and all of those in my generational line. 
who have lived from fearful and unbelieving hearts. Father, I ask for the restoration of the ancient past where joy and gladness are overtaking me. You, Jesus, are love. You, Jesus, alone are full of compassion, loving kindness, and goodness. Father, I need you to show me how to walk in humility. Now, Holy Spirit, I ask you, wash my mind, my will, and my emotions with the blood of the Lamb. So that I may know truth in my inmost being. I just allow the Holy Spirit to show you any area where you're operating in pride. This was a big one for me because I was taught growing up, I heard this almost every day of my life, it's up to you. It's on you to make it work. You can't trust other people. It's on you to do this. That's pride. So just ask the Lord to show you any area in your life where there's pride that's been operating. I love weakness. I love brokenness. I love living low. I love leaving, live, living my life in complete, absolute dependency of the Holy Spirit. I'm just as dependent on God this morning, almost 40 years later, as I was that first time. Ask him to now, by his Holy Spirit, to invade that place. Last thing, thank you, Lord, that you have forgiven all of my iniquities and you have healed all of my diseases.